world needs people who can think. Our world needs people who can create. Our world needs people who are curious. Our world needs people like Dwayne Matthews. Dwayne is an innovation evangelist. He is a consultant on the future of education. He's a really, really interesting person. Um, and, and, and he provides us with a deep understanding of the potential of education to move into a whole new ecosystem. I'm really excited to talk with him today. I can't wait, let's go. Bill, it is so awesome to be with you again. How is uh, the glorious city of Sydney traveling today? Oh, look, the glorious city of Sydney is doing what it does best, which is spring weather. Right, that's as good as you're gonna give me today, is that right? Oh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, I, I, look, I could go into a whole lot of stuff about how Sydney is absolutely fantastic, but yeah. you might believe it anyway, so what's the point? Well, that's very true. It doesn't feature in the top 10 or top five most livable cities in the world, like our very good friend here, Dwayne Matthews, and I'm really excited to have you with us today, Dwayne. I'm going to launch into our very first question, and our very first question is one that we ask all of our, our Game Changer guests, and that is, tell us a little bit about your personal story and how you've gotten to where you are today. Sure, and, and, and thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me. And, you know, we, we talk a little bit about the spring weather. Um, it's dead of winter here in Toronto, and we're at about 17 degrees Celsius, which is good news and bad news all at the same time. But um, here in Toronto, we always talk about the weather. So, um, you know, thank you very much for having me. And a, a little bit about me. I started out my career teaching grades three, four, five, and six, and a little bit of library at uh, what we call in Toronto a model school or what a lot of places around the world called a, an inner city school. Um, and I then went to Lima, Peru and I spent two years in Lima, Peru working at FDR. Um, I worked under a great superintendent by the name of Fred Wesson, um, did that for two years. And while I was driving through a, a town called La Oroya, which is probably about, um, it, well, it, it's definitely the, the highest road in the world. And while I was going through that town, this little mining town, I, I had an epiphany and I decided that I was going to leave education. And so I, I left education and I went into the world of technology transfer and technology scouting. And what I looked for was any kind of technology that would shift a paradigm, completely change an industry. And I did that for a number of years. I exited that company, um, you know, nothing super exciting. There's nothing Italian parked in the driveway. We did okay. And then I started another company, which was an absolute abysmal failure. And once I was sitting licking my wounds from that failure, I really started to think about these two worlds that I loved, which is the world of education and the world of technology and how technology would impact the world. And, and what I realized was a lot of the school systems around the planet did not have a good sense of the impact of the fourth industrial revolution and all of the technologies and how that would impact economy. And so I really set out to do that. So I did a little bit of work with the neuroscience lab at the University of Montreal, working with Dr. Jocelyn Colbert. Um, I, I've done a little bit of work with folks in machine learning, AI, robotics, all around education. And I help organizations think about the future of learning and its connection to the future of work. Dwayne, I'm hearing you talking about a whole lot of different things that you, that that you've done, and, and and I note now that you're 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 the founder of Tomorrow Now Learning Labs. Um, what's the project that you're engaged in right now that's got the potential to be a real game changer in creating today's learning for tomorrow's world? Sure. And so, Tomorrow Now Learning Lab. What do we do? We we look at two things. We we look at mental frameworks. And then we look at fourth industrial, industrial revolution technology and how do those things combine? One of the things that I've realized is that um, the future belongs to the generalist, really sort of the, the polymathic. And how do you do that? Well, you have to create a certain amount of perpendicular thinking. So you have to really look at what industries exist inside of a silo and what is another type of industry where you can, we can create or cross pollinate and that's one of the things that we're doing. So we really look at how does education actually connect to its genuine purpose? I believe my contention is, um, you know, when we go back to the beginning of formal education, formal education was really about creating productive citizens that could contribute to the greater good. And also 
um, have a, a much better life. And so somewhere along the, the road, we've gotten very, very specific. And as we got very specific, education became more about how many people can we put into post-secondary education? Where do we slot them in? And you know, then how do we use post-secondary education institutions to sort of categorize who goes where? It is a very big giant factory-like model that's based on a factory-like economy. And as our economy starts to shift, we're beginning to see the digital transformation of economy and the speed has left a lot of people flat-footed. So, you know, if you think the space between the Gutenberg printing press mm -hmm. and the Gutenberg Bible is about 150 years, you know, that, that's roughly three generations of people. The people that created the, the you know, the, the printing press did not see the book. Um, so we've always had this luxury of looking backwards. Um, but now because of the speed of innovation, um, we don't necessarily have that luxury. And if you, you know, I, I started at the beginning, we were talking a little bit about kids. I have two children, one is 11 and one is three. When I, I had my son, I only had a, a Blackberry phone. There was, you know, no real social media to talk of. Um, no massive amounts of pictures. Today, um, you know, I, I have my daughter and the phone that I have has 11.8 billion transistors on a single chip. I can create movies, I can create videos. Um, I could probably control a satellite um, from my phone. So it really has changed. So in terms of what are we doing different? What we are looking to do is, is we are working on how do you scale personalization? How do you scale personalized learning and how do you put that personalized learning in the context of productivity um, and economy? So how do you help students to co-create the type of economy that they would like to see now that they have the tools um, available to them? So I, I think, you know, we can do that by bringing post-secondary education way down um, and we can be a lot more efficient if we give up some of the sacred cows that we have. Dwayne, there's so much in, in, in what you've just said and, and we, might, we might take some time to tease apart a few of those issues. I wanna go back to that notion of the purpose of education. You talk about the genuine purpose of education being originally to create productive citizens who could lead a good and constructive life to do good and right in the world. That notion of course, started somewhere around the time of the ancient Greeks and we, we sort of inherited that tradition of education. The ancient Greeks didn't believe in an education for all. They believed in an education for some. And, right. you know, and, and so education and the way it was done was always done with an undercurrent of protecting privilege and providing inequity um, and excluding others, including all of the slaves who kept that classical Greek economy going around the Mediterranean. We don't believe in that sort of thing now. And if there's anything we're learning from this year outside of the world of education, it's that the world simply won't tolerate um, a lack of diversity, a lack of equity and a lack of inclusion anymore. How can we use technology to promote equity of access and inclusion in education? I think one of the things that we're able to do with technology is technology is, you know, one of the conversations that we were having here in Toronto was inequity because of technology, right? So once COVID-19 came and everybody sort of went online, um, there were at least in the Toronto District School Board, which is the, the largest public um, school board in Toronto, um, there were probably about 20,000 families that didn't have access. And so people were very concerned about equity. And I said, well, you know, let's, let's look at it another way. Let's look at if we were to provide everybody access to digital access, um, we would be able to engage in different levels of, of equity. We would be able to personalize learning at scale. So if you can imagine a classroom, regardless of the size of the classroom, we talk a lot about differentiated learning, but we know that that's very, very difficult to do in an analog world. Um, if, if we look at all of the and, 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 tools- and, 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 Go ahead. And Dwayne, Dwayne, if I can just interrupt you for a moment, let's be frank, 
there's no classroom in the world that's really doing differentiated learning in an analog no. world. We've been talking about it for 30 years and we're not doing it. And you can't, and, and you know, this is something like when I was teaching, one of the challenges that I had is, uh, you know, my principal came to me and said, you have individual education plans. There's nine of them in your classroom. And so you're going to have to do 10 different lessons, one for the, the, the main group and then these nine different ones. And I said, well, how would I do that? Um, you know, how do I do that? And that becomes very, very different to difficult to do. And it's very difficult to do it at scale. But I think if you have, um, if you have digital tools, you're able to, to do a lot of that. And when I mean digital tools, I, I don't necessarily mean, um, you know, like we have a suite of Google Docs or Google Classroom, but I, I really look at it as technology has always been more about a tool than an end in of itself. So if we sat down and we said, you know, what would we like to do? What is it that our goal is? Then we can go and find technological tools to be able to help us. And one of the challenges that we have, one of the challenges that we have, um, and not just in education, but, but you know, in, in a lot of industries, is we tend to optimize form over function, right? And then let me give you an example. Um, you know, in, in, my, in my previous life, I, I did a little bit of work in, um, in, in the VC space, and we ran into BMW, and BMW had this $100 million VC, um, corporate VC, and what they were going to do is they were going to invest in mobile. And I thought that really strange. And when we, we went back and we thought about it, we said, why would they invest in mobile? And then we started to think about the job of a small car. The job of a small car is really to get an entry level person, a young person from A to B. And so when we're thinking about A to B, we're thinking, well, you know, they wanna drive. Well, actually, no, they wanna leave their parents and they wanna go see their friends. And so all of a sudden, this is pre-social media, all of a sudden social media comes up and lo and behold, entry level cars around the world, the sales drop to almost nothing. Why? Because young people no longer need a car. The job that they needed to get done was to create these shallow relationships with as many people as possible. Well, social media does a really good job at that. So now we don't necessarily need to sell as many cars. We were optimizing for form. We were making better cars, nicer cars, but we weren't optimizing for function, which is the job that the person was trying to, trying to get done. And so th this, this idea is not mine. This is Clayton Christensen, who was uh, the late Chris Clayton Christensen, um, who was a Harvard business scholar. And, but when you start to think about innovations and you start to realize that we're optimizing for form, right? So if we think about a school, you know, we make a better building, but it's still the same box, it's still Sage on the stage. We, we put all the digital tools in there. We have the, the laptops, but everybody's still looking to the front of the class. They're still looking to the teacher um, to lead. And there's an elephant in the room. The teacher does not know everything. The teacher can no longer know everything. And the only way that they're going to be able to differentiate at scale is if they have some way to augment themselves. And, and that tool needs to be digital and not necessarily a, a, a laptop or a tablet, but it needs to be a digital tool based on the articulated challenge that's ahead. You know, Dwayne, you've just um, confirmed for me, and Phil's going to hate me saying this, of course, you've just confirmed for me why design, product design and technology and the arts are so critical in schools, because it's, its focus is not only on the aesthetic, which is the form component, but its inherent focus is on the functionality of everything that they produce. Someone in a product design class is not only wanting to create a beautiful piece of furniture, but it has to be ergonomically functional for an individual to interact and use it. Same, same in, a, in, a, in a visual communication design class when we're looking at uh, architecture or, or you know, for, for public spaces. Yes, we want it to have an aesthetic that appeals to the eye because we all love beautiful things, but we also need its function in terms of the spatial relationships, how, how we interact with it, how each space interacts with one another. And that's really interesting. This is a really interesting conversation because those schools who have adopted a design thinking framework are ones that are closer to this intersection of form and functionality through the use of not only the cognitive abilities, but of course, uh, technology augmented uh, with a view of how it's gonna support individuals 
in this evolution of work that we're constantly seeing on a, on a, on a fast paced basis and the type of skills that young people are gonna to need to thrive in this new world economy and not just the economy, just socially across the globe. What I'm interested in to, um, from you is so much of what you shared around the work of tomorrow now in the learning labs in your first answer when Phil asked you the question, is this intersection of the future of education, of disruptive technology and the evolution of work? What is the role of the human cognitive ability and their metacognition in all of that? Right, and so, you know, it's a great, it's a great, great question. And I, I usually tease my son. I say, if I say it's a great question, it's because they don't know the answer. But, um, you know, I, I think uh, when I think about human intelligence, I, I think that human intelligence must be bridged with digital transformational intelligence to co-create. I, I, I believe that technology is a hammer. Um, it's a screwdriver. And just because you have a hammer and a screwdriver doesn't mean that you can design a house. And so I think it really is about what kinds of outcomes do we want to create? Now, when I was a child, we were dictated the, the deal. The social deal was dictated to me, right? Um, and you know, it said, this is the deal and, and you try your very best to master this. You know, so I, I went to school in Trinidad and Tobago. We, we have a, a British system. So you know, the deal is I, I have to get past a common entrance exam at 11 and that'll give me an opportunity. And that opportunity is gonna give me another opportunity. So I have a series of gates to go through. Um, and you know, there's not much thinking on my part, uh, at least until I'm 22, right? But where I think the opportunity is now is looking at how do we grab these innovations and start thinking cognitively about the types of outcomes that we want. How do we co-create the world, right? Like I said to someone, I said, you know, th there's an opportunity for us to follow abundance all the way down um, and create a world where we don't really want stuff anymore. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I go, imagine if we could 3D print everything, right? You know, so now there are people that are 3D printing food. Imagine we could 3D print food, clothes. Imagine what that does to industry. And all of a sudden, what happens when you have plenty of something, right? It becomes a commodity. You know, if, if you... You know, I live here in Toronto, and when I was growing up, um, you know, I used to, when I lived in Trinidad, I, I had a bucket, and I would pour hot water into this bucket, and that was all the water that I had to take a bath. And I said, you know what, when I, when I grow up, I want to be able to take a 10-minute shower, and I would be a really happy person. And so, you know, when I lost one of my companies, I was standing in the shower about 20 minutes in and realizing, oh, my gosh, here I am, right? And so, so I'm at this place. And I realize I now have the opportunity to think and I have the opportunity to co-create. I think it's really important that kids not look at how do I master the technology because they don't need to master the technology. I had to learn penmanship. I go with my daughter's three. I put the tablet in front of her. I leave it with her for two days and she's an expert. So we don't necessarily have to master the innovations but we do have to think about the types of outcomes that we want. And, and that component is gonna be very, very important moving forward. Um, because of the commodity of, of narratology or the commodity of semiotics, we, it's very hard for us to gauge on what's right and what's wrong, right? We're, you know, we're, we're looking at an election in the United States where to me, it seems really obvious that most people should have voted one way, but there are 67 million people that voted in the other direction. And mm -hmm. I sort of wonder, how is that possible? And I realize that they're all falling into a story and not actually thinking. Yeah. So we have one people that are in a tribe and other people that are in a tribe and you, know, you can't have a conversation between them because mm -hmm. they're not really thinking. And so I believe that the actual cognition becomes way more important at this stage. So a lot of people are like, Dwayne, tomorrow in our learning lab, it seems like really technology focused. I'm like, actually, no, we're actually thinking focused really mental frameworks focus and the technology is a tool i really believe that you know the future is human led and purpose driven and technology augmented and so i really think that we have to spend a lot more time teaching kids how to think and a lot less time teaching them how to adapt on a story 
And we're not getting them to choose a side, to choose a tribe. We're getting them to think, what kind of world would you like to go out and co-create? I right? want to extend, and, and, sorry, I just want to jump in there, Dwayne. I, want to, I kind of want to extend this thinking a little bit further. Uh, I, I love how you've, you've moved from not just ways of knowing, but into this ways of thinking and now ways of being. Yeah. Um, so much of this kind of intersection between technology being augmented in, in the learning paradigm right now is still focused on academic outcomes and it is still focused on a pseudo kind of skill acquisition for this new world of work. What I'm interested in is, is taking it a step further that we don't just focus on supporting young people to build the necessary mastery or proficiency or skill or knowledge, but the, the necessary dispositions to thrive in, in today's world for, for their future. How can we better utilize the power and advancement, the swift advancement of technology to support a deeper consciousness within the young people that we support around their own personal true north discovery, their openness to place and their commitment to our natural world, and of course, their openness to difference and the other. Right, so, so great questions. And, and what I think is we teach them to liberate themselves. So, in, in, you know, forgive me, I, I, I usually try to bring it to analogies that makes sense. And, and what I mean by that is, here's an analogy. Once upon a time, 98% of us were farmers. And we spent most of our time farming, most of our effort farming. And now 2% of us are farmers. And we haven't run out of food. We have an excess of food. And that gave us the liberty to do other things. So now I don't think about farming. I just go to the grocery on Sunday. Um, but that allows me to learn to read. It allows me to think. It allows me to, to explore, to ponder. I go, that gets stunted because we have to go to work. Yeah. Right? Where we, 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 need to, we need to actually find money to exchange for this food. I believe that as we liberate ourselves and we use technology to really push for abundance of time, specifically, um, we're going to have a lot more time to to explore regions of our humanity that we're not able to do. I mean, if, if you consider, um, you know, the amount of time, I, I don't know what the traffic is like there, but if you consider the amount of time, you know, if it takes two hours to get to work, to and from work, you spend eight hours there, another hour to sort of get your food ready, um, you have about an hour and a half left in the day before you can go to bed. Um, so it, 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 the average person has a very difficult time spending time thinking about these things. So I think first we encourage young people to free themselves, mm -hmm. right? And, but while we're doing that, we have to encourage them to learn how to think, right? And, and how to get to the first principle of it all. Like once we start thinking, um, you know, I, I'm doing a project where we're looking at systemic racism, um, you know, and, and a lot of people believe that systemic racism really has to do with the personal. It has to do with, you know, Dwayne and this one particular person and the interaction between them. But it really is a lot more complex than that, right? Like we, we have a lot more complex pieces. We have, we have laws and we have those laws aggregated together into structure. And then we have that in terms of internalization. Do I feel a sense of privilege? Is this world for me? Or do I feel a lack thereof where I'm a salmon swimming upstream all the time, right? Like I, I joke with people, I say, you know, I, I have two options. I, I, I can be, you know, a criminal in someone's mind, or I can be Barack Obama in someone's mind, yeah. but I need to choose. I, I don't necessarily have the opportunity, at least the way that I was raised, to believe that I have a lot of middle where I could just be normal, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, you know, I, I think once you, you look at the complexity of that, you can now get into it. I think if that becomes obvious, if you have time to sit down and think, and you don't believe that, you know, the watering hole is gonna be less, um, you, have, you have a lot more time to really reflect on that. I, I really do think that um, interdependence and abundance um, brings peace. And the more we have of it, um, the more peace we're gonna have. So I, I really think we need to push education 
into that direction just for our own personal selfishness, right? Um, you know, people always talk about doing things for others, but I think for our own personal selfishness, if we can have that, um, we're going to be able to co-create or imagine, co-create a world that we would like. So, Dwayne, is that the future of school? So, I, I, I definitely do. I, when I envision the future of school, I envision personalization at scale. Because so you're, you're, you're I, sorry, sorry to jump in there, because what, what I'm hearing you share with us is the power of this social exchange. And, and, and developing a, a social, an emotional, and, and, and a personal kind of, and a cultural awareness that, that is a deep consciousness of the other now. It, it involves ethics, uh, it involves morals, it involves integrity. So these ways of being, it, ultimately it's about our character by the sounds of it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think so. I, I, think, I think we have to become, we, we have to think about digital innovation Mm-hmm. as a means to make us more human. And, and that, that sounds counterintuitive, but I do think that we've been looking at it wrong. Um, there's been a concern that it would make us less human or yeah. make us um, redundant, but I think we really have to think about it as a way to make us more human, right? How do we, how do we connect better? I mean, if you can imagine personalization at scale, um, you know, if, if I could find the best teacher in Australia, that the best teacher for me, if I could find um, another teacher somewhere else in a peer that would yeah. be able to shed some light on, on a certain situation somewhere else in the world, um, how much better would I be? And the, the fact is we can do that now at a rudimentary level. Um, and in two years, we're, we're, we're gonna be exponentially better at being able to do it. And two years after that, we're gonna be even exponentially better at doing it. The challenge is that, you know, we have a G, Genie's lamp, and we don't know what questions to ask. And so now we need to really start focusing our students on the questions. What questions should you be asking, right? It shouldn't be about just mastery of knowledge. What questions should we ask? Wayne, I, I, I want to I want to jump in here. I'm really interested in in the way in which we lead towards this. And this is actually a question for you too, Adriana, because it's. It's, it's a rare opportunity for a, uh, a history teacher to sit in the esteemed company of an elementary school teacher and an art teacher. Um, and, both, and both of you are evangelists. You know, Dwayne, you, you're an innovation evangelist. Um, Adriano, you, you, are, you, you are a design uh, evangelist. You know, why do we need evangelists to help us get to where we need to get to? You know, evangelism is really about spreading the good news right? And um, what's the good news? And so if if you think about any industry, you have a vested interest in things becoming as stable as possible, and then mastering the stability of that space, right? So the the, the status quo breeds itself. And so if if you need some sort of new innovative way of thinking, then you need to have someone to come along, A, to spread the good news, and to have you engage with that good news at scale. So an evangelist really comes along and spreads lots of seeds. You plant seeds everywhere. So for example, right now, the conversation around education, you know, is, well, do you go talk to schools? Well, it may not necessarily be schools. It it may be a business. It may be Google. It may be the bank. It may be, you know, a church. We don't know where these seeds are going to pick up. There's just all of a sudden this morphing homeschool idea that seemed really crazy a few years ago, but now there are millions of people and they're starting to have these, you know, interesting connections. So I think evangelism is is really important that way. And then the other thing is that I think that, you know, the evangelist has an opportunity to sort of be a generalist, not really a master of anything, sort of like a jack of all trades and looking at how do these things connect? If you think about an expert, you know, to, to get to a terminal degree, you go from broad, you go down to high school, decide what you want to do, you go to university, get a degree, and the terminal degree is you focusing on one question, right? So if, if you spent five years of your life focusing on one question, there's a lot that you'll miss out if the world's moving exponentially every 18 to 24 months, right? You, you could look up and see a whole different world. So I, I think it's really important for the evangelist to grab from different places and, and to 
put a cross section. So, uh, you know, from my point of view, I grabbed from fourth industrial revolution. We were looking at, you know, uh, autonomous vehicles and mines, um, you know, in, in, in Madagascar in, in 2012. And so this is before, you know, the whole Tesla piece and these big massive four story trucks that are driving around by themselves. And I was able to see from there, I'm like, these innovations are gonna have a profound impact on our economy and just how we live and our schools aren't seeing that. So somebody has to come and say, hey, let me show you what's happening over here and let me show you how it intersects and let me create demonstrations for you to understand. And I'll just need 15% of you to come in and, and see what we're doing and then we can have a shot at having some change. Yeah, um, from my perspective, Dwayne, I've always believed that everything benefits from good design. So I'm a little biased in that regard, but for, from a design classroom context or a design thinking framework, it ultimately refers to this kind of intersection of cognition strategy and, and a practical kind of process to solve very really complex problems. And often they are human problems. They're not necessarily just a product or a service. Uh, they're, they're about uh, how someone feels in, instead of just living in this world, it's how they feel in this world. And it often amplifies kind of methods from across different fields. And it's kind of interdisciplinary in so many ways uh, where, where there's a focus on creating learning experiences that help young people unlock their creative potential and apply it to real world contexts where we continually prepare students to practically and critically think consistently, to solve challenges consistently, and to create value for themselves, for the place, and of course, you know, for the other in this, in this new kind of world that we find ourselves in. Um, so much of what it is that ultimately benefits from really good design thinking or design learning is that we learn how to grow, we learn how to connect, and we actually learn how to make change. And that's why I'm always going to be, you know, a huge advocate uh, for spruiking for it. You use the word evangelization. I'm, I'm quite happy to adopt that uh, uh, as well as, as, a, as a way of um, continually spruiking the value of this kind of application of knowing, thinking and being. So, so I, I, I just want to jump. I love that. Um, I absolutely love that. And, and one of the reasons... Um, you know, we, we, my son and I, we go through the design thinking framework when we're attacking any problem mm -hmm. um, or any opportunity. And it, and it could be from anything, right? It could be, you know, my son, when we started um, our, our pandemic pod, if you will, um, we started off listening to Hamilton, the musical. Yeah. And he just, he just loved Hamilton, the musical. And so he would just look at it over and over. And so slowly but surely, all these questions start to come up. And so we use that design thinking framework to say, well, let's see if we can create something that would be interesting mm -hmm. around Hamilton. And we had all these little pieces and exactly what you said in terms of allowing him to connect. You know, when he was in a formal class, he started to feel a bit beaten down, right? In that, in that, in that typical class, because, you know, there's all these things that he just wasn't really interested in. And so he started to have a conversation with himself about himself because he wasn't interested in those things. But once we were able to say, well, I'm really interested in the mental framework of your thinking. So I really, I'm not caring that much what content you pass through it. I just want you to dive into this content and, and create something that you connect with because I wanna teach you how to think that way. I wanna teach you how to empathize with something. I wanna teach you how to say, okay, well, you know, I've, I've done a lot of empathizing. Let me define something. Let me ID it. Let me come up with some ideas and let me get very comfortable with the fact that, you know, I'm going to put something together and it's going to be an MVP. It's not mm -hmm. going to be perfect. And I'm mm -hmm. going to iterate and I have to get really comfortable with this iteration process to always be looking at it and flipping it. So, you know, one of the really interesting things was I that it was me saying, you know what, dad's great on stage. I love interacting. The bigger the room, the better. And I like to come off the stage and, and get right in close to the people. I like to get a connection and walk through the audience and that sort of stuff. And, but I can't do that in these virtual spaces. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time trying to think, where do I set up in my house and how far can I make the angle so I can walk? And so I said, this is dad's problem. And so he started to ask me questions. And then he said, you know, I, I have an idea. 
and we went into a whole project framework based on design thinking where he came up with something that you know and you guys will, will have a chance to see that i don't think anybody's done before and so i sat back and i said you're 11 and you've done something that i go i allowed you the time and you use this design thinking methodology into something that was really interesting to you and i mean he went 10 straight hours working on something one wow. day and then 10 straight hours working on the other day and um but it allows for more of his humanity to come forward which i think is yeah. really really important you know you know what i love about what you're sharing Dwayne, is the magic you've just explained the magic of design thinking and the magic of it is that it, it fosters an intrinsic motivation in young people to want to be simply better than they were yesterday. It actually taps into the natural curiosity of the individual and, and it just amplifies it. But what you just shared there is the real, the real magic is that you, gave, you, you allowed the permission for that to happen. So, yeah. you know, this notion of iteration is open to the possibility of failure, but it's iterate, iterate, iterate. And somewhere along that line, the magic is not necessarily the end product. It's the process and the growth and achievement that happens throughout that journey. But the power in what you just shared was that you believed in your son, you actively listened to him and you gave him permission to keep in that place of struggle for him to discover his aha moment. And I tell you, you know, that is so much of what a human centered purpose-driven, augmented, uh, you know, a technology augmented kind of learning environment really should be like. Uh, and yeah, I just no, want to I, say, you know, thank you for sharing that. Well, and, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm um, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, and one of the things that, you know, we went through at the very beginning was uh, we were trying to figure out how to work on his math and that sort of stuff. And I said, you know what? I go, let's, let's just do a, a gap analysis, right? Let's just think about where do you have gaps and let's, Let's celebrate finding those gaps and then let's celebrate yeah. different ways of thinking about how can we solve it, whether we solve it or not, right? So let's go and say, okay, I'm gonna go on Khan's Academy and I found some gaps. I'm gonna look at the videos, I'm gonna check YouTube. And it was amazing to me how much of his self-talk about being smart was really around if he could remember everything, mm -hmm. right? So it, it took maybe two weeks for me to say, hey, listen, you have like three devices that respond on your words. I go, you don't even, so you don't sit here looking sad that you have a gap. I go, we all have gaps. I go, but once you get into this idea of, you know, I, I can just sort of be with this and I can put it down and come back to it. You know, we, we look at um, in the morning, tomorrow in our lab, we look at um, YouTube videos, the beginning. So we start our day with mindfulness, we have a morning meeting and then we look at YouTube videos of uh, the one that we into right now is this guy called the Hacksmith, which is a, a series of engineers that make things. And right there, you can say, remember we're talking about this design thinking, look at how they put their projects down. They come back to it a couple months later. Look at how many times they fail. Look at how they expect to fail. Look at how they're like, ah, oh, that didn't work. I go, this is, you know, this is part of the process. I go and everything's like that. I go and uh, our problem is, we've sort of taught kids that you started 100% and we're going to take points away. Um, but we really should reverse that and say, hey, you, you can just continuously keep on adding all the time. Because really, if you if you think about it, like it's everywhere, you know, I, I say to him, you ever wonder, why do we like the new Range Rover better than the old Range Rover? Mm -hmm. I go, that's always the case, right? Like we always like the new Range Rover better than the old Range Rover, even though it seems <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> Unless you're a hipster looking for retro stuff there, Dwayne. Yeah, yeah, well. There's a great Australian Australian uh, pub band called Regurgitator. who have got a song, I like your old stuff better than your new stuff. But I think they're just being deliberately contrarian. Hey, right. um, Wayne, it's, it, uh, Dwayne, uh, listening, listening to you and your story, you've seen a lot of the world. You, you really have, you know. In, in your story, there's Jamaica, there's Canada, there's Peru, there's, there's United Nations, there's Africa, there's, there's the, the work you're doing to connect with people everywhere around and about the place. One last question for you. What does the world need now? I genuinely believe that the world needs to educate its children 
differently to prepare for 2030. And, and let me let me give that some context. Um, much of the challenges that we have are around a few premises. The premise of scarcity is one. Um, we, we have a premise of scarcity. I, I think, you know, we, we probably grabbed onto it when we went from hunters and gatherers to agriculture and we started storing stuff. Um, you know, and, and we have this premise of scarcity that drives our economy, it drives our, our borders. Um, and if we really think about it, um, you know, we, we don't necessarily have a problem of scarcity. What we have is a problem distribution. Right, you know, if, if I go to Toronto, the, the, if I were to tabulate the millions and millions of pounds of food that we throw out um, every day, I, I'm sure that Toronto alone could probably put a dent in world hunger. If, if I were to replicate that across all the Western world cities, um, I'm, I'm sure the rest of the world would have the same problems that we have. So I think that we have been taught based on the, you know, the, the, the symbols of scarcity. Um, and up until a certain point, I think that was true. I think we we're at a point where if we were to chase abundance and interdependence, I believe that we would be able to co-create and find the peace that we're looking for. Um, and I, I think that should be the pursuit. I think if we were to pursue that um, through our education, our, our, our kids will come up and switch, you know, I used to spend a lot of time speaking to adults and someone said to me, they go, do not waste your time on the people of the past. You should have your conversations with the adults of the future. And I, I genuinely believe that if we have that conversation where adults of the future start thinking, what if the world was abundant? And what if we could leverage our technology instead of thinking about scarcity to, to think about abundance, what would that look like? Um, and, and, and how would that make us interconnect? So instead of us thinking about slicing pies all day, how do we think about baking pies? And, you know, I used to be in clean technology and a lot of people will say, well, won't we run out of stuff, right? And I, I would say, no, I, I actually think we'd get to a point where we'd stop wanting as much stuff. We, we would want more meaning. I think we only want stuff because we don't have it, right? I, I don't crave a bottle of water, right? Like I, I don't even think about it. Um, once upon a time, that was really important to me growing up. I go, but now I don't, I don't think about it. I open one, I leave one open, I get to another one, right? Um, but now I start thinking about health differently, right? And so I, I think if we get to that place of, of abundance and we leverage innovation to do that, and we start having people look at the human side, we'll get to a place where we'll say, maybe I don't need as much stuff. And maybe I need to start thinking more around self-actualization and connecting with others because I don't need to have what they have because I have it too. Um, and, and I think that changes everything. And maybe the, uh, the, the question is to think about what we are genuinely abundant in and how we can be interdependent around all of that. I'm, I'm really, really, I, do you know, there, there are some days I love talking and there's some days I love listening. And today I've just enjoyed listening so much to, to you, Dwayne, and those rich, rich ideas. The conversation, particularly between you and Adriano, I think has been both in abundant and interdependent. And it's been uh, a, just a, an absolute pleasure for, to have you, to share your expertise, your, your wisdom, your perspective on the world. Um, uh, we wish you well in everything that you're doing at the moment as a, as a, as a father and you know, as, a, as a husband and through all of the, the enterprise that you're doing. Um, keep up the good work. So, so thank you very much for your kind words. And I, I want to really thank you guys. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's 930 at night here. And, you know, you, you've really allowed me to, to stretch my thinking. I, I loved um, the interaction, the questions, um, the design thinking piece. I, I could talk about that forever. Um, I, I think you it, and Adriano. it was... Yeah, it was it was a real it was a real pleasure for me to um, to to speak. And it's funny, I'm I'm looking at a picture that I have here of of a, a place that's probably about maybe five minutes from my parents. And my, my goal for this place was to just have thinkers come and sit down and really get into these rich conversations. And um, definitely, when that comes into fruition, you guys are going to get an invitation. This has been a great conversation. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. 
The Game Changers podcast is produced by Oliver Cummins for Orbital Productions. It's powered by schoolfortomorrow.com and circle.education. It's available on Apple Podcasts, on SoundCloud, on Spotify and on Google. If you like what you hear, tell your friends, subscribe, like, you know what to do. Let's go.